Okay, hi everybody, welcome. Welcome to the North Dakota State University Spring Fever Garden Forums. This is where we connect you, the gardener, with the experts at North Dakota State University. And my name is Tom Kolb. I'm an extension horticulturist in the Department of Plant Sciences. And I'm here tonight with Bob Birch, a web technology specialist in the Department of Agriculture Communication. Tonight is the fourth and final of our Spring Fever Garden Forums. And our theme tonight is on new pests and new crops. The format that we use tonight will be the format we've used in the past. We'll start with about a 20, 25 minute presentation, and then we'll follow that with your questions. And we invite your participation. For those of you on Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, you'll notice there's a purple tab in the lower right hand corner. Just tap on that to open the chat box. And you'll see a box that says, say something. Type in that box and push the enter key and then that question will come to me and then I'll add that of the speaker. So let's get started. Here we go. The world keeps getting smaller and there are insects from all over the world that are coming to the doorstep of North Dakota or invading our state right now. So here to tell us about some invasive insects to watch out for is Dr. Janet Canoto. Jan is an extension entomologist for NDSU. Jan, welcome to the forums. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Good. <clears throat> well, good evening. First, I'd like to thank Tom for inviting me to speak today at the spring welcome. fever, although I don't feel like <laughs> it's spring quite yet. <laughs> but let's get started um, with the presentation. Um, I'm going to cover four of the invasive insects that you may or may not hopefully see in North Dakota. One that has been found in North Dakota and has been considered established is the Japanese beetle. And the, the following three here are not in North Dakota. The brown marmorated stink bug, emerald ash borer, and lily leaf beetle. But I want you to be aware of how to identify these pests and we'll just talk a little bit about the damage or injury symptoms because you may not see the insect uh, but you may see the damage on the plants. So we'll get started with the Japanese beetle that is um, already here in North Dakota. Um, as you can imagine it's from Japan originally. And then it was first found in the U.S. and New Jersey in 1916, and then up in Canada in 1939, and then more recently it was found in Portugal in 1980s. This map of the USA gives you a better idea of how far this insect has moved, you know, throughout the northeast and moving all the way south down into Georgia and other states and moving west towards um, many of the other states, um, including um, North Dakota. And the purple is where it's been established, the dark purple is where it's been established by consensus, light purple is where it's been established by survey, and that's mainly the trap that I'll talk about. It's a fairly in easy insect to identify. First off, it's a beautiful insect. It's large, it's about a half inch long, a metallic green prothorax, and the wing covers are kind of coppery bronze color. And the key to identification of this speci species is the white patches. There's five on the side and two on the posterior end. And those are unique to Japanese beetle. For the life cycle, just real quickly, uh, right now it's overwintering as a third instar mature larvae. They'll come up when it starts to warm up when the soils get to 50 degrees um, Fahrenheit. And they'll start to feed for about a month. Then they'll go through a short pupil stage usually a week to 10 days, and then the adults emerge, they'll mate, and then the female will lay up to 60 eggs in the soil, and then those eggs will hatch into larvae, and they pass through three growth stages, we call them. 
and they feed on the roots of the plants, typically grasses. And then as it gets colder, they'll move deeper back down into the soil for overwintering. Now the adult is a notorious pest uh, feeding on many different species of trees, shrubs, or orn ornamentals, or roses. Uh, it can be very devastating and skeletonizes the leaves. Whereas the larvae are white grubs. And so they have the characteristic three, uh, C shape with a brown head capsule. And they are about an inch when mature. And they feed just on grasses. So <clears throat> you'll notice some brown patches out in the yard. And then if you dig and pull, the grass will come up easily. And you can pull it back to find the grubs that are feeding on the roots. Now they're a little more difficult to identify the larvae. And there's a lot of other white grubs here in North Dakota. So you shouldn't assume it's Japanese beetle if you see a white grub. You need to look at the posterior end for a raster pattern, which is like hairs. Um, over on the left, you can see the Japanese beetle. That has a V-shaped raster pattern. And then the line above it is called the anal slit. And you can see that's kind of like a half moon uh, shape. And the other species that's most commonly found here is the May or June beetle. And you can see the raster pattern is kind of like two lines straight. And then the anal slip has a little bit of a, a V in it. So those that's probably the most common one that you'll, you will find. You might see the northern mass Schaefer or the uh, Apodius, but they're not quite as, as common. But again, they have unique raster patterns. And we've been trapping for Japanese beetle uh, since 1960 here in North Dakota. Yeah, the first beetles that were caught were in 2001, and then we didn't see them again in the traps till 2012. And now we've been catching them every year since 2012. It's a very powerful pheromone trap. It can draw them in from over half a mile. It's a combination of a sex and plant attractant or volatile. And then we had another incident in 2017 when Japanese beetle was accidentally introduced. A nursery stock from Minnesota trucks that came in carrying the larvae in the soil. And there was over 100,000 potentially infested plants. And that got shipped, unfortunately, out to 80 nurseries across North Dakota. <clears throat> so they put up 12, 100, 1,000, excuse me, and 203 traps in 50 counties. And then they caught beetles in 22 of these counties. And 80% of them were caught at nurseries that received the infested nursery stock. And you'll also notice that the highest numbers were those near our larger cities like Fargo, Bismarck, Minot, and Williston. They probably received more of the nursery stock. And there is a fact sheet uh, that has recently been updated. Um, you can use that for information. And also for um, insecticide guidelines, I encourage you to look at Purdue University Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide online. You can download it as a PDF. But we also have insecticide guidelines for both homeowner and the commercial nursery person. Moving on, the brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, this is another um, insect that is fairly distinctive and quite large. It was originally introduced into Allentown, Pennsylvania in 1998, and it spread rather quickly throughout the mid-Atlantic states. And now it's confirmed in 44 states and four provinces, but it's mainly just a severe problem over there in the mid-Atlantic states. Um, in North Dakota, you see word green, which means brown marmorated stink bug was detected or intercepted 
And we did receive a couple live specimens that came in boxes shipped from infested states. Um, so we have detected it here, but those uh, shipments came through the plant diagnostic lab here at NDSU. And as far as we know, they did not get outside. It was in the middle of winter, so they would have died anyway, <laughs> fortunately. Again, it's a large insect, about five-eighths of an inch long. So you can see it's about the size of a penny there. You can identify it by those white bands in the antenna, and then there's black and white alternating bands on the sides. And if I was to turn this stink bug over, the light, it's very light on the undersides compared to some of our native species. It has a wide hole of strange. It gets onto a lot of our ornamental shrubs, our trees, fruits, vegetables, and our field crops. <clears throat> and out east, uh, where it was introduced, it's been particularly a problem on the fruits and vegetables. It's just starting to become a problem in soybeans, corn. And they do like to feed with their piercing, sucking mouth parts on the reproductive tissues. Just real quickly, the life cycle, they overwinter as adults in the shelter belts and leaf litter, and they'll get active in the spring when temperatures warm up, and then the, the male and females will mate. The female lay eggs on the leaves, usually the, either the upper or the lower surface, and she can lay quite a few eggs, as you can see there, 486. That's a lot. And then they go through the uh, nymph stage the egg, from the egg, they'll hatch into nymphs, and they have four different stages they go through. These are wingless stages, and then once they become an adult, they have wings, and they can, they're fairly good flower, flyers. <clears throat> There's about one to two generations per year. Uh, they're fairly short life cycles, so it's about a one to two months to go from egg to adult. And unfortunately, they like to winter in our homes or as well as the shelter belts. <laughs> and here's some of the symptoms on our soybeans. Uh, they inject a toxin into the seed and then it also becomes kind of shriveled up. You'll see punctures. Um, and then we're also concerned that they may be able to vector viruses and plant pathogens. And here in corn, our sweet corn, you can see the punctured kernels again. Uh, these are all characteristic of stink bug feeding injury. You can see the brown, that's an indication of the toxin on the leaf. And here they are in the fall trying to get into the home, just like the Asian lady beetle. And over in the east, in Maryland, some of the old states, um, this is, they occur in the thousands trying to get into your home. And it looks like there's hope. Um, there's some biological control that's being worked on the Samaria wasp, uh, Trialessus japonicus, and uh, it's an egg parasitoid in, in Asia where this pest originated. Uh, 60 to 90 percent of the eggs were destroyed or killed by this parasitoid. And they were collecting it. They collected it from Asia, brought it over here. It was in quarantine and they were going to release it. But then one of the scientists did a survey in 2014 and 15 and found it here. So apparently it came over with brown marmorated stink bug when it was introduced. So now what they're doing is mass rearing it and they're releasing it at some of the worst infestation sites for controlled brown marmorate stink bug. <clears throat> Moving on to emerald ash borer. I know many of you are familiar with this, uh, but I just wanted to touch bases with this because of a new detection close to us. So we're really concerned. Here's a couple of educational fact sheets we have available. Uh, they're both in the process of being updated this spring. So look for the new revised version that should be coming out in May or June. 
Uh, this is about a half inch long, again, a good size insect, so, you, you know, they're easy to notice as the adults. Um, there is a pheromone trap that you can get to trap for the adult. Uh, beautiful purplish uh, bronze uh, wing covers, and there's lots of information online if you want to go to the Emerald Ash Borer info site. And here's the new list map from April 2nd, 2018. And look at the infestation new site up in Manitoba, Winnipeg. Not good news. Um, we don't know for sure, you know, how they'll do um, that far north. Uh, the researchers have mentioned that it has the progression of the movements into new areas north has slowed and a lot of it is going more southward now. Uh, look at the symptoms because um, the adult is only out for you know a short period maybe about a, a month usually it's they start to merge mid-July peak emergence is late July and there's a degree D model that is available for forecasting emergence. Look for the thinning of the canopy on ash. They go to several species of ash, the green, black, Maturian ash, and look for suckers that indicate something speeding internally. And also the D-shaped exit holes of the adults. And if your the tree is dead and you do remove the bark, you may see a S-shaped tunnel which indicates the emerald ash borer. And again, we think its main movement is from people moving firewood. And that's how it was believed that it was introduced into the U.S. is through crates, wooden crates that were infested with the larvae. And here's the information on cold hardiness. As you can see, they get down into minus 30. There's 98% kill. And but Vanette and Abrahamson found the super cooling point is minus 13 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's just when the point when the tissues in the insect dies. So minus 13 is when it all starts. And I don't know how long it has to be exposed to certain temperatures to actually cause mortality. That's something we'll have to see. Again, there's a lot of work with biological control. These are all organisms that were collected over in Asia where it originated, and they're now being released and studied for biological control. So there is hope down the road. In fact, they're thinking about deregulating emerald ash borer in the future here, and the emphasis is going to be on these parasitoids. Okay, the last insect I have is the lily leaf beetle. It's a beautiful insect. This is probably my favorite one. Um, it's a scar, also called the uh, red leaf beetle or the scarlet leaf beetle for obvious reasons. It's about a half inch long, a beautiful scarlet red, um, and the egg, legs, uh, eyes, antenna, and head are all black. And the larvae have a nasty habit of excreting their brown frass piles on the back. And this is a protective mechanism to discourage predators from eating them. <clears throat> However, the research has shown that it doesn't work very well against parasoid, par parasoids or parasigwas. And this one is native to both um, Asia and Europe. It was first detected in Montreal in 1940, and then Boston, 1992, and then now much of New England, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, and much of Canada, and the west coast of the U.S. And you can go online, the Lily Leaf Beetle Tracker website, um, and find out where it's at, or if you have a report to file. They're asking you to submit it to this website. And here's where it's at, um, the most recent map. 
Um, as you can see, it's throughout the New England states and east, and then all the way across into Canada, and even just above North Dakota there in Manitoba, which is kind of alarming to me, because I love my lilies. <laughs> And they do love lilies. The Asiatic lilies, some of the Oriental lilies are more resistant or tolerant of this insect. And you can download some of the fact sheets from Massachusetts and some of the other Rhode Island. Um, and they list some of the varieties that are a little more resistant. But these are some of my favorite flowers. They do not infest day lilies, so these are okay. But they will also get on the fertile area, which are another favorite of mine. And then they also won't complete their life cycle, but they will feed on solemn sealed potato and nightshades, cat briar, and flowering tobacco. And here's the damage, complete defoliation. They eat the leaves, the flowers, the buds anything above ground and as you can see if it's very severe they'll completely defoliate the plant so all you have is a skeleton and this can you know kill the plant here's some feeding on solemn seal and the life cycle they overwinter in leaf litter and then as it warms up in the springs they'll get going and then the female lay eggs usually on the underside of the leaf near the mid midrib. She lays, um, I think it was 460 some eggs. It's a large number for her over whole lifetime. The eggs will hatch into the larvae, and then the larvae feed most of the summer. And then late summer, they'll pupate down into the soil. And in about a week, the new generation of the adult that overwinters will emerge. And this feeds for a short period on the vegetation just to get some fat deposits before overwintering. And again, the main emphasis is biological control. Uh, there is some egg parasitoids, but the two uh, pictured here are um, both larval parasitoids. And these are being released and study in the New England states. I listened to an interesting uh, presentation when I was at the International IPM Symposium in Baltimore a few weeks ago. So if you find any of these insects, uh, what we'd like you to do is to place them into a, a vial containing rubbing alcohol or ethanol. And then record the date and GPS if you know it. And then the host plant. And then submit it to uh, us at Extension Entomology for a positive ID. Um, and you can go through your county extension agent. Or you can also submit it to the plant diagnostic lab. Damn, I'm done a little bit early. <laughs> okay, sounds good. <clears throat> Get some questions for you. Okay, Jan, let's start with the uh, Japanese beetle. Okay. So, if you hang traps for Japanese beetles, are you actually drawing them into your area? Yeah, that's correct. Um, the unfortunately, that um, pheromone and the plant attractant is so strong, it'll actually draw them into your garden so if you have roses nearby it's going to make the infestation level worse on the roses so we don't recommend if you have like a garden um don't place it um you know within a half mile <laughs> if you so want to monitor <laughs> yeah <laughs> somebody else's <laughs> yard um but yes um unfortunately the same thing with the brown marmorated stink bug. There is a, a sex pheromone they're using for monitoring for that one, but they found it actually attracts it in to the area, and then it'll, it'll they aggregate then, and it'll cause more damage to your plants. So the Japanese beetle, it seems to be here to stay. Yes, it does. 
And with that type of a track, that you, we don't recommend that a gardener use trapping. No. 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 Just let give it to your give a trap to your neighbor for Christmas. Yeah. A neighbor that you don't <laughs> like. There you go. I always thought that's the way. So they'll be yeah. so happy when they collect all those yeah, the, beetles, and they won't know that actually they took the whole neighborhood <laughs> beetles with them. Yeah, the, we're using the traps mainly for regulatory work for detection. You know, pre presence, yeah. absence. Like for nurseries. And right. Parts. Right. And um, we, how do you control Japanese beetle if you see it? Yeah, I, I didn't go into that because I knew I wouldn't have time to discuss that <laughs> for, for all the insects. So, but you can control the um, adult with foliar sprays, but a lot of times it's difficult to get good coverage if the tree is large. So most people focus on the larvae grub, which is down in the soil. And I, I took a slide out on what is the proper timing to control the grubs, but it's usually when they come back up and the, um, at, they go down when it gets real hot feeding, but usually it's um, August when they start to come back, late August, they come back up to do some feeding. So that would be a good time. And then also um, <clears throat> they do some more feeding in the early spring, they come back up. Okay, speaking of the grubs, do the Japanese beetle grubs or larvae, do, do they feed on tree and shrub roots or only turf roots? The grub only feeds on, well, they will feed on mm -hmm. in container, only in container nursery stock. They'll feed on the roots of um, the container stock because it's in a container, right. but out in the natural setting, they mainly just feed on grass roots. And are we seeing lawn damage? by Japanese I, beetles in our state? No, I haven't. It's I've had several people call telling me they, they have Japanese beetle, but then I asked them to send in the larvae, and so far they've all been our uh, June beetle, which is our native species that occurs here. Uh, okay, let's shift on to the brown marmorated stink bug. It says uh, we have a comment that Penn State Extension shows that that pest occurs in Clay and Wilkin counties in Minnesota, which right. are located across from Fargo and Wapaton. Do you know how long they've been there? Um, I checked into that. Um, they're only in the Minneapolis area. That Clay report was not correct oh. or it was a specimen that what came in through a package like what oh. we received okay so it hadn't yeah. established itself there. right right yeah we were concerned about that so i called some people who are working on the brown marmorated at university of minnesota and they said that's not a a true record it was an intercepted record Got that it. came in the shipment and there's a question about do we have sprays available to control that pest yes yeah, there's um <clears throat> a number of sprays available um there's synthetic insecticides in the pyrethroid family work fairly well and one of the active ingredients by fenthrin uh works pretty good for control of the adult i know there's been a lot of work with biopesticides like neem and some of the others but they don't they're not as high in toxicity compared mm -hmm. to some of our synthetic uh, insecticides so they probably give you some suppression but not control okay how about uh a big picture question here what effect will climate change have on the spread of invasive insects well obviously um sting bugs for example is typically more of a southern insect pest um, where they, it occurs quite frequently as a major pest on crops and fruits and et cetera um, down south. So if we do continue getting warmer, we're going to start to see more steam bugs. So and we should other always, pests. always be happy 
when it's freezing yeah. cold. <laughs> Let's be happy it's really just, cold. <laughs> or just, uh, just we want about a week or so of freezing cold temperatures <laughs> to kill those nasty bugs. Yes, That's and we did have we a need. cold winter, um, so it may have had some effect on Japanese beetles as well no. as emerald ash ore this year. Yeah, not too much snow cover either. Right? Yes, Generally yes. Speaking. Okay, how about that emerald ash for, you know, you said the super cooling temp is minus 13, mm -hmm. but there's only 98% death at minus 30. So right. how do they survive? How do those 2% survive? Well, part of it is, you know, the duration, I oh, suppose, I of the cold, I and see. then they're in the tree. So Sorry. even though our air temperature might be minus 30 or the wind chill might be minus 30, the tree does moderate the okay. temperature. Do you think the emerald ash borer may adapt to those bitter cold temperatures like minus 30 and will develop like a, a super subspecies that can tolerate the, the bitter cold? It could happen. happen. It, it could happen. Other insects have adapted to our colder temperatures. I know there was some work done on soybean aphid, which is another invasive insect pest. It's like Indiana. You know, uh, <clears throat> like we saw that infestation in Winnipeg now, yeah. But, you know, when you look at Minnesota, that pest has been detected there for several years, but it hasn't really spread like wildfire like it did in Michigan. Right. Do you have a, so like, is there, is there a reason for hope that uh, the Winnipeg infestation will be very slow to spread our way, just like in the Twin Cities, it hasn't really, yes, could there that is just be some. isolated? Yeah, that's been already hinted to in some of the research papers I've read. You know, they mentioned that the spread of the emerald ash borer is much slower to the north compared to the south. So, and that's obviously due to our colder temperatures. So, that is possible. And, and the biological control agents would probably be better able to keep up with it as well if it's a little bit slower spread. How about, uh, well, do they spread, do they have those biological control agents in Minnesota? Do they yeah, release them? Yeah, they're releasing them uh, in Minnesota. So yeah. Maybe they'll do that math told me. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Please. And how about, uh, there's a general question about, you know, a lot of these insects you talked about tonight are not yet here. Mm -hmm. What What is here? What's, what's the most common insect pest you get reports from gardeners about? <clears throat> A lot of cutworms uh, reports, uh, spider mates, oh, aphids, maybe. aphids uh, gall insects. Those are the easy ones, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're not so interesting. It's old news. How about you got a comment about another invasive pest, spotted winged or softball? Uh, yes, and the, also I didn't mention one that we're very concerned with in our canola crop, and it's the Swede Midge, and it's up in Canada, um, and it's moving, well, it could move into our area. We trap for it every year up in the northeast and north central, the major canola producing areas, but it also gets into our vegetables, any Bracaceae crop, uh, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower. Um, so we could um, see it in the garden as well. In fact, they found it in Minneapolis last year. It was accidentally brought in on trans vegetable transplants, and it was introduced into the Minneapolis area from mm -hmm. uh, it was from an infested state like New York. So that would be like on broccoli plants mm -hmm. and cabbage plants. Yep, and it's very small. It's a midge, so people tend to, you know, miss it. And then the larvae are, are also very tiny and they feed in the growing point or down near the base of the root and cause deformities in the plant. So that's one I'm concerned about um, and I'm expecting it eventually to 
to get here as well. It's it was reported um, just about ten miles north of the our um, Canadian North Dakota border, um, just near a little bit um, east of Langdon. But very, it's very very close. Bugs keep coming. Yeah. <laughs> Can't stop them. And That's job security for you, Jan. That's a good thing. Yeah. Always new bugs to deal with. You asked about spotted winged drosophila, yeah. and that one has <laughs> continued just to continue to spread. And there's a lot and, of active research going on it here at NDSU. Right. As well as other fruit producing states like Michigan State. Yeah, right? yeah, there's tremendous. There's like so many papers that come out every month in the journal. See, it's very difficult to keep up with all the research. Isn't there a website that's dedicated to SW? Is that SWD.org? Yeah, like uh, yeah, I think there's one in South Michigan Carolina. South Carolina. Oh, and then there's one at Michigan, too. Yeah, right. yeah. How about a back of biological, biological control? Do they, uh, are those insects tolerant to our cold, or do they have to be? reintroduce or they will have to adapt as well oh uh, which ones so just in general the biological oh. control uh, beneficial oh. insects uh, well we actually uh, when they go overseas to find these biological parasitoids uh, they actually try to go to areas further north of the uh, range of the paths that we're targeting so they Excellent. will try to find parasitoids from different locales to uh, bring in things that are more adapted to our cold uh, winters. Okay, how about, uh, here's a question about ladybugs. <clears throat> uh, this gardener had ladybugs, but they were more orange than red. Uh -huh. Are they really lady, are they still ladybugs? Yes, there's all different um, species of ladybugs and then the Asian multicolored uh, lady beetle, that one has different colors. It can be uh, without spots. It can have up to 14 spots. And I've even seen kind of a more yellowish color. When they first molt, they're not quite as red. But yeah, you can have um, different colors um, and different numbers of spots as well it's very very diverse yeah, okay yeah there's all kinds of ladybugs yes. out there it, <clears throat> but the main thing for identification of the asian lady beetle is that inverted m on the prothorax there's a white m or w and that is always there no matter what okay but is, are there any other questions out there Okay, I think uh, we got it all covered here. Yep. Thank you, Jan, for your presentation. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Th thanks for your help um, out in the fields. It really helps having people um, out there looking for these insects.